By the end of this video, you should be able to use the idea of particles to explain the properties of solids, liquids and gases. You should then be able to describe how the particles in solids, liquids and gases have got different amounts of energy. So let's get started by discussing the idea of kinetic theory. The first critical idea is that all objects are made of particles, and these particles are arranged differently in solids, liquids and gases. Now we can use this idea to explain the properties of solids, liquids and gases, and the word properties means how they behave. So we're going to start by looking at the properties of solids. Here are some solids. We've got a coffee mug, a wine glass, some bricks and a fork. Solids have two important properties which you have to learn. Firstly, all solids have a fixed shape which does not change. Secondly, solids cannot be compressed if we squeeze them. So let's take a look at how the particles are arranged in solids and see if we can explain these properties. Here are the particles in a solid. The first key idea to get is that the particles in a solid are held together by strong forces of attraction. Because the particles cannot move from place to place, solids have a fixed shape. The second point is that the particles in a solid are very close together, and because there are no spaces, the particles cannot move closer together, so solids cannot be compressed. There is one other key feature of particles in a solid. In a solid, the particles vibrate, but they don't move from place to place. Because they can only vibrate, the particles in a solid only have a small amount of kinetic energy. And remember that kinetic energy is the energy of movement. Now we're going to take a look at the properties of liquids. Here are a couple of liquids, and the first key property is that liquids are very hard to compress if you squeeze them. Secondly, liquids always take the shape of their container. In other words, liquids can flow from place to place. So let's take a look at the particles in a liquid and see if we can explain these two properties. The first thing that we can see is that the particles in a liquid are close together. There are forces of attraction between the particles in a liquid, but these forces are not as strong as the forces of attraction in a solid. Because the particles in a liquid are already close together, it's very hard to compress a liquid. The second key feature of liquids is that the particles are moving from place to place, and that means that liquids flow and take the shape of their container. Now as you can see, the particles in a liquid are moving, so we can say that the particles in a liquid have quite a lot of kinetic energy. We're going to take a look now at gases. Gases are very easy to compress, and we can see this with an aerosol. An aerosol contains gas that has been compressed, and when we press the top of the aerosol, the gas is released. The second property of gases is that they take the shape of their container and they move and flow. So if we look at the particles in a gas, we can explain these properties. First of all, the particles in a gas are very, very far apart. In fact, they're much further apart than I can really show in this diagram. That's because there are virtually no forces of attraction at all between particles in a gas. This means that we can easily compress gases because there's so much space between the particles. The second key point about gas particles is that they move randomly. So that means that gases flow and they can easily take the shape of their container. So because gas particles are moving rapidly, the gas particles have a very large amount of kinetic energy. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe how heat can be transferred by infrared radiation. You should also be able to describe how different coloured surfaces emit or absorb different amounts of heat by infrared radiation. This shows you an image of a woman taken with an infrared camera. Infrared radiation is a bit like light, except we can't see it with the human eye, but we can see it with special cameras. Warm objects can lose heat by infrared radiation, and that includes humans. We can see that in this picture. The warm parts of this woman's face, such as her forehead, are releasing a lot of infrared radiation, and they appear lighter coloured. Her nose is cool, and you can see that it's releasing less infrared radiation, so it appears darker. This is what you need to learn. Warm objects lose heat by emitting infrared radiation and hotter objects emit more infrared radiation than cooler objects. So how does the colour of a surface affect the amount of infrared radiation it emits? Well, dark matte surfaces are very good emitters of infrared radiation. The word matte means not shiny, so this polo shirt is dark and matte, 
and that means that it will emit a lot of infrared radiation. Dark and matte surfaces are also really good absorbers of infrared radiation. So if you go out in the sun wearing a black shirt, you'll start to feel really hot as you absorb infrared radiation from the sun. You can see that here with these penguins. The penguins are pointing their backs at the sun and because their backs are black, they absorb more infrared radiation which keeps them warm. Light or shiny surfaces are not good at emitting infrared radiation and you can see that here. This coffee cup is white so it emits less infrared helping to keep the coffee hot. This person's keeping warm with a foil blanket because the shiny surface won't allow heat to escape from her body by infrared. And this food is kept hot in a foil case because it's shiny so it won't lose heat by infrared. Shiny surfaces don't absorb infrared either and you can see that here. This space probe is covered with foil which doesn't absorb infrared heat from the sun. In fact foil simply reflects infrared heat back. By the end of this video you should be able to explain how certain materials can conduct heat by looking at how the particles are arranged. You should also be able to describe the role of free electrons and heat conduction by metals. And finally, you should then be able to describe how insulators reduce the amount of heat that can be transferred by conduction. Okay, so in this topic we're looking at how heat energy can move from place to place. Now there are four main ways that heat energy can move, and you're expected to be able to describe each one. The first way is by infrared radiation, and we looked at that in the last video. Heat can also move by conduction through solids, which we look at in this video. And in later videos, we'll take a look at how heat can move by convection through liquids and gases, and also by a process called evaporation. Conduction takes place in solids, and especially in metals, and I'm showing you that in this diagram here. At the top, we've got a really hot piece of metal, and you can see that because it's glowing white hot. The heat energy is passing through these metal bars by conduction and you can see how hot these bars are becoming. We're going to look at how heat moves by conduction, and you should be able to explain that in terms of how the particles are arranged. The best conductors are solids. Liquids and gases are very poor conductors. In a previous video, we looked at how the particles are arranged in solids, and I'm showing you that here. The first really important idea is that the particles in a solid are tightly packed together. In fact, the particles are all touching each other, and there are no spaces between them. The particles in a solid cannot move, but they can vibrate, and we're seeing that here. I'm showing you here the particles in a solid, and I'm going to heat one end like this. The heat gives energy to the particles, so they vibrate harder. Because all the particles are touching, the vibrations now pass across to the particles next to them, like this. So that means that the heat energy is now making its way along the solid as the vibrations spread from one particle to the next, and now the heat has fully spread right along the solid. Remember that heat moves by conduction through solids, and that's because the particles are very close together, so vibrations can easily pass between them. Now, I said at the start that metals are really good conductors of heat, and you need to know why. Metals are solids, so the particles are packed close together, and vibrations can easily spread between them. But metals have another special property, making them great conductors, and that is that metals have got free electrons. These free electrons can move, and they can carry energy like this, and that makes metals really great conductors of heat. Lastly, we're going to take a look at insulators. Insulators reduce heat movement by conduction, and I've got some examples for you here. This is an insulating jacket, here's a polystyrene cup for hot drinks, and here's a polystyrene box to keep food hot. All of these are good insulators, which means that they reduce heat movement by conduction. You need to be able to explain how insulators reduce heat movement, and it's all to do with how the particles are arranged. So I've shown you here how the particles are arranged in an insulator, and you can compare them with the particles in a conductor. The really obvious difference is that the particles in an insulator are not tightly packed, in fact, they have massive spaces in between them. And what that means is that when the particles vibrate in an insulator, the vibrations cannot be easily passed onto nearby particles. In other words, the heat energy cannot easily move through the insulator. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe how heat energy can be transferred by convection in liquids and gases, and explain convection in terms of the particles involved.
And finally, you should be able to explain why convection cannot take place in solids. We've been looking at how particles are arranged in solids, liquids and gases, so let's recap. In a solid, all the particles are tightly packed together and they cannot move, they can only vibrate. Particles in a liquid are still close together, but they are moving. And finally, particles in a gas are very far apart and are moving very rapidly. In the last video, we looked at conduction. Conduction takes place in solids and the heat energy is spread by vibration between the particles and we can see that here. I'm heating one end of a solid and that causes the particles to vibrate. Because the particles are really close together in a solid, this causes the nearby particles to vibrate and this vibration passes down the solid carrying heat energy. So solids are often really good conductors. Heat can also move by another process which is called convection. Some students do find convection a bit tricky, but it's not as hard as you might think. You may need to watch this video a couple of times, but you will get it. The key thing is that you must be able to describe the process. The first key fact is that convection takes place in liquids and gases, but not in solids, and you'll see why in a minute. So what actually is convection? Most people get the idea that heat rises. This is called convection. So convection is when heat rises from warm objects. Here are three examples of convection. We've got here a light bulb and a radiator and both of these are hot. This causes the air above them to warm and the air rises carrying the heat. We can also get convection in liquids like this boiling water. Again the water here is heated and so that heat energy rises up. We know that heat can move by convection in liquids and gases, but how does it work? Well, we can explain this by looking at the particles. Here are the particles in a liquid, and just to remind you that these are quite close together, but they are also moving. I'm going to heat the bottom here. This causes the particles to gain energy, and I'm showing them in red. The particles are now moving faster, so these particles are colliding with each other more, and this causes them to move further apart like this. Because the particles are more spaced out, this area is less dense than the region above it, so the particles rise up through the liquid. Cooler water now moves in to take its place, and then this gains heat energy and this rises, and this process continues. You could be asked to explain how convection works. So to recap, when we heat the liquid, this causes the particles to gain heat energy. The particles now move further apart, and this warm water is now less dense. Therefore it rises and cool water sinks to take its place. Scientists call these convection currents. Now we did say at the beginning that convection can only happen in liquids and gases. Convection cannot happen in a solid, and we can see why by looking at the particles in a solid. Remember that the particles in a solid cannot move, so convection cannot take place in a solid. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe how evaporation can transfer heat energy. You should be able to explain evaporation in terms of particles, and finally you should be able to describe the conditions that increase the speed of evaporation. I've got here a cup of coffee and the question is why do hot drinks get cold? Well, we've already seen how heat energy can move by conduction, convection and radiation. But there is another way that heat energy can move and that's by evaporation of liquids. If we look at the particles in a liquid, we can see that they're moving around like this. The particles are attracted to each other, which is what keeps them together in the liquid. Some of the particles on the surface might have enough energy to break away from the others and turn into a gas, and this is called evaporation. So evaporation is when a liquid turns into a gas. The particles which are leaving the surface are carrying away energy. That means that the liquid is losing energy, in other words, it's getting colder. So we can say that evaporation cools down hot liquids. Certain conditions can make evaporation happen faster, and we can see this by looking at washing that has been hung out to dry. When we dry washing like this, the clothes dry because the water is evaporating. Evaporation is faster on hot days, on dry days, and on windy days. All of these conditions speed up evaporation. Evaporation is also used by animals to keep cool. This includes sweating and panting. In both of these cases, evaporation takes heat energy away, helping to cool the animal. By the end of this video, you should be able to use the idea of specific heat capacity to calculate the energy needed to raise the temperature of a given mass of substance. I'm going to be honest here, this can look tricky and it does contain some maths.
but I promise you that the equation is quite easy once you get the idea, so please stick with it and you will get it. OK, we're going to answer this question. How much energy does it take to heat water? To answer this question, we need to understand the idea of specific heat capacity. The specific heat capacity tells us the amount of energy needed to raise a temperature of 1 kilogram of a substance by 1 degree Celsius. You don't need to learn any values for specific heat capacities. Everything you need will be given in the exam. So here's a question that we're going to answer. Calculate the energy needed to increase the temperature of 2 kilograms of water from 20 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. To answer this question, we use the following equation. Don't panic, it's not as scary as it looks. And I should remind you that you're given this equation in the exam, and you're also given the value for any specific heat capacity that you need. The energy in joules equals the mass in kilograms multiplied by the specific heat capacity multiplied by the temperature change in degrees Celsius. Let's put our numbers into the equation. The mass is 2 kilograms. The specific heat capacity for water is 4200, and remember you are given that in the exam. The temperature increased from 20 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius, which means that the value for the temperature change is 80 degrees Celsius. This gives us a value for the energy needed of 672,000 joules. The one thing that students tend to get wrong in this calculation is not using the temperature change. Some students simply put in the final temperature, but that's incorrect. You have to work out the temperature change. You should be getting the idea that specific heat capacity really isn't that tricky. So here's another question for you to try. An iron has an aluminium plate with a mass of 1.5 kilograms. The temperature rises from 20 degrees Celsius to 200 degrees Celsius. Calculate the energy needed. OK, so let's put the numbers into the equation. The mass is 1.5 kilograms. The specific heat capacity of aluminium is 913 and the temperature changes 180 degrees Celsius because the iron went from 20 degrees Celsius to 200 degrees Celsius. This gives us a value for the energy needed of 246,510 joules. Here's a final question for you to try. This is a higher level question, so it's a bit trickier. A hot water bottle cools down from 80 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius, releasing 756,000 joules of energy. Calculate the mass of the water in the hot water bottle. Here's our equation again, but this time we're given the energy and we're asked to calculate the mass of the water. That means that we need to rearrange the equation to find the mass. So the mass is given by the energy divided by the specific heat capacity multiplied by the temperature change. Putting our numbers into the equation gives us a mass of 3 kilograms for the water in the hot water bottle. Don't be surprised if you get a question like this in the higher level exam. At the end of this video, you should be able to describe, in terms of particles, how insulators reduce heat movement. You should then be able to explain that u-values give us an idea of the effectiveness of an insulator, and then use u-values to compare different insulators. We've looked at how heat can move by conduction. Remember that solids are good conductors of heat, but liquids and gases are not. This is due to the arrangement of particles in solids. The particles in a solid are tightly packed together. Particles in a solid cannot move from place to place, but they can vibrate. So I've got a solid here, and you can see the particles vibrating. If I heat one end, then the particles vibrate with greater energy. This causes them to collide with nearby particles, spreading the energy and carrying the heat. Metals are especially good conductors of heat, and that's because they have free electrons which can move and carry the heat energy. So in this video, we're looking at insulators. Remember that insulators reduce heat movement, and I'm showing you three insulators here. So how do insulators reduce heat movement? Well, it's all about the arrangement of particles. Insulators have large spaces between the particles, and these spaces make it harder for vibrations to pass from one particle to another. This means that heat energy cannot easily pass through an insulator. The effectiveness of different insulators can be determined from the u-value. Now here's a key fact that you have to learn. The lower the u-value, the better the insulator. You won't be asked to calculate u-values in the exam, but you may be given them for different insulators and asked to determine which is the best. I've got here a picture showing single glazed and double glazed glass. Single glazed glass has a u-value around 
and double glazed glass has a U value of around 3.7. So as you can see the double glazing has a lower U value, which tells us that double glazing is a better insulator than single glazing. Double glazing is a better insulator because it has a layer of air trapped between the two panes of glass. Remember that gases such as air are very poor conductors of heat. Double glazing saves us money because less heat can escape to outside. However, I should point out that double glazing is much more expensive than single glazing. There are other ways to reduce heat loss from our house. One of these is loft insulation, which works really well and is not expensive. This insulating fibre has a really low U value, which makes it an effective insulator. Another way of reducing heat loss is to use cavity wall insulation. Here, insulating fibre is packed into the spaces between the external walls of a house. Again, this fibre has a really low U value, making it a good insulator. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe how the rate that heat moves is affected by the surface area and volume of an object. You should then be able to describe how animals are adapted for hot and cold conditions. This often comes up as an essay question. We're going to explore this topic by looking at animals, since this is a really great way to illustrate the ideas that you need to understand. So we're going to start by looking at surface area and volume. Remember that heat is lost from an object's surface, and we've looked at how this heat can be lost. Heat can be lost by conduction, convection, radiation and evaporation. Objects with a larger surface area lose heat faster than those with a smaller surface area. Here's a key fact that you need to learn. Smaller objects have a larger surface area for their volume than larger objects. So that means that smaller objects cool down faster than larger objects. Now we can actually see this with animals. Animals in cold conditions tend to be larger than those in warm conditions. And a good example is penguins. We find emperor penguins in Antarctica where it gets extremely cold, and emperor penguins are really large. Here's a picture of some emperor penguins. The adult penguins are over a metre tall, so for their volume these penguins have a relatively small surface area so they can keep warm. Just to compare, this picture shows you a blue penguin to the same scale. Blue penguins are only about 30 centimetres tall and we find these in warm conditions in Australia and New Zealand. Because they're small, blue penguins have quite a large surface area for their volume, so they're going to lose quite a lot of heat, but it's not a problem as they live in warm conditions. So you need to remember that animals with a large surface area will lose heat faster. So let's look at another example. We can find elephants in both Africa and in Asia, but African elephants have a real problem with heat. Africa is really hot and the heat from the sun is intense, so African elephants have to be able to lose heat quickly. To do this, African elephants have really large ears with a huge surface area, so warm blood passes through these ears and loses heat. Asian elephants don't have such a big problem with heat, since they do not live in such hot conditions, so their ears are smaller. Another good example of animals with a large surface area are desert foxes. These pictures show you desert foxes, which live in hot conditions in Africa. Desert foxes have massive ears, which give them a really large surface area, helping them to lose heat. These pictures show you arctic foxes, which live in the very cold conditions of the arctic. Straight away we can see that arctic foxes have got very small ears. This means that arctic foxes have a relatively small surface area, so they lose heat less quickly than the desert fox. The other thing that you'll notice is that both of these animals are very light coloured. Remember that lighter surfaces absorb less infrared radiation than darker surfaces, so that means that the desert fox does not get hot in the sun. If it was darker, it could get too hot. Also, lighter surfaces are really bad at emitting infrared radiation, so in the case of the arctic fox, it doesn't lose much heat. If it was darker, it could get too cold. We can also see that the desert fox has very thin fur, which means that it can easily lose heat by convection to the air whereas the arctic fox has really thick fur, which acts as an insulator, reducing heat loss from the arctic fox's body. There is one final adaptation that both of these animals show. Both the desert fox and the arctic fox have fur on the bottom of their feet, but for two different reasons. In the case of the desert fox, this fur protects the fox from the heat of the sand, but in the case of the arctic fox, the fur reduces the amount of heat loss by conduction to the snow. Humans have learned how to keep machines cool by using the example of animals. This shows you a cooling system for a computer.
You can see here that it has fins. These increase the surface area, allowing heat to escape faster. And if we compare a computer cooling system with a Desert Fox, you can see the similarity. So both the computer cooling system and the Desert Fox have a large surface area, so that heat can escape faster. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe how a vacuum flask is designed to reduce heat transfer by conduction, convection, radiation and evaporation. I should point out that this has come up as an essay question and may well come up again, so you really need to learn this. This shows a vacuum flask, and the key thing you need to understand is that vacuum flasks keep hot things hot and cold things cold. In other words, vacuum flasks are designed to reduce heat transfer. So in this video, we're going to look at how the features of a vacuum flask help to reduce heat transfer. Remember there are four ways that heat energy is transferred, and these are conduction, convection, radiation and evaporation. The vacuum flask is designed to reduce all of these. I'm showing you here a drawing of the inside of a vacuum flask. We can see that we have a plastic top, silvered glass walls, a vacuum between the glass walls, and plastic supports. We're going to look at how each of these reduce the transfer of heat energy. We'll start by looking at the plastic top. This reduces energy transfer by conduction, convection and evaporation, so let's see how. First of all, plastic is a good insulator, so that reduces conduction. Heat transfer by convection is reduced as convection currents are blocked by the top and heat transfer by evaporation is reduced as water molecules which do evaporate are trapped inside the flask. Let's look now at the silvered glass walls. These reduce energy transfer by conduction and radiation. Glass is a poor conductor, so that reduces heat transfer by conduction. Silver reflects infrared radiation back into the liquid and stops it being emitted. Between the layers of glass is a vacuum. This prevents both conduction and convection, and that's because both of these processes require particles. In a vacuum we find very few particles, so that reduces both conduction and convection. Finally, let's look at the plastic supports. These reduce energy transfer by conduction. As we've seen, plastic is a good insulator, so conduction of heat is reduced. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe how different insulators can be used to reduce heat loss from a house. You should then be able to evaluate different types of insulation using the idea of payback time. This picture shows you two different buildings, and we're using an infrared camera to see how much heat energy is passing out of each building. This is a well insulated building, and we can tell that because not very much heat energy is being released through the walls or the windows. On the other hand, this is a poorly insulated building. As you can see, a lot of heat energy is being released, and this is wasted energy. We've looked at insulators in a previous video. Remember that we can evaluate the effectiveness of different insulators by looking at their U values. Good insulators have a low U value. They reduce heat transfer. This shows you a single glazed and a double glazed window. As you can see, the double glazed window has a lower U value than the single glazed window, and this tells us that double glazing is a better insulator. That's because double glazing has a layer of air trapped between the panes of glass. Air is a poor conductor of heat. There are several other ways we can insulate a house. We can use loft insulation to reduce heat loss through the roof, and cavity wall insulation to reduce heat loss through the walls. Both of these work in a similar way. Air is trapped between the fibres. That means that convection currents cannot form, which reduces convection. We've already seen that air is a poor conductor. We've looked at double glazing and we've seen how it reduces heat loss through windows. We can even use really cheap methods, such as a draft excluder, to prevent air from passing under doors. When we insulate a house, we save money on heating bills, but there is a problem here. Each of these insulation methods has a different cost. Some are really expensive, such as double glazing, whereas others are much cheaper, for example loft insulation. So the question is, is the cost of an insulation method really worth it in terms of the money saved? We can work this out by looking at the payback time. This tells us how many years it will take to pay back the cost of the different insulation methods, 
and this is based on the energy saved each year. Let's calculate the payback time for different types of insulation. Double glazing costs around £5,000 to install, but it saves us around £200 per year in heating costs. We find the payback time by dividing the total cost by the savings per year. So if we divide £5,000 by £200, we get a payback time of 25 years. That means it will take 25 years to pay back the cost of double glazing. Loft insulation costs £300 to install, but it can save us £150 per year in heating bills. That means that the payback time for loft insulation is only two years. Cavity wall insulation costs around £800 to install, and it saves us around £200 per year. So the payback time for cavity wall insulation is around four years. You can make your own draft excluder for a couple of pounds, so we can't really calculate the payback time for that. 